Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. I am delighted to be back with Professor Julia Greer. Julia, as always, thank you for having me in your office. Thank you for coming and visiting us again. This is such, such a fun experience. Awesome, awesome. All right, Julia, today we're going to pick up right at that formative moment we left last time. You shared with me this obvious feeling that you had between MIT and Caltech the faculty at Caltech were just having fun. And that resonated with you, and that made it a very easy decision. So from day one, how did that culture of fun and adventurousness at Caltech inform the kind of Caltech professor you wanted to be, the way you wanted to build your lab, the way you wanted to build your group, who was around that might be early collaborators for you? So the question there is, you saw the fun, how did you activate that as you began your career at Caltech? Yeah, I should probably preface this by saying it wasn't an easy decision. No, was, no, 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 it wasn't. It no. was, it was, uh, I thought about it. I mean, MIT obviously has the allure of MIT, right? Definitely. And it was very um, scholarly in a way. And it was, you know, the, the walls and the hallways were so, well, because I was an undergrad there, you know, like there was something very, very special and intellectually um, admire. There was a lot of admiration that I had for the place. Um, and the Caltech, it, it wasn't so much that it was fun, it just felt human. Like it felt very, like I could belong there with no, people liked each other, people had a true sense of community and um, collaborations were very easy and everything was done on a human level. So yeah. I really connected with that, like I resonated with that. It wasn't like a big institutionalized something. People talked to me. I went to dinner with faculty. I went to. I had a conversation. I walked somewhere with Harry Outwater, right? Like, and we interacted, and it was just a, a very interactive sort of the original FaceTime kind of a kind of a thing. So when I first arrived, it all seemed unreal, right? There I was. I had my own lab. They were asking me questions like, "What color carpet do you want in your office?" <laughs> As a third-year grad student, right? And I'm like, "Wow, I get to choose my own carpet." And then what? color do you want to paint the walls in your lab? I remember that question very well. And I'm like, I had never had to think about something like this. Like, seriously, I you're asking me what color? And so I was like, oh, let's do happy yellow and green, you know, <laughs> earth colors, something like that. So I think that from the very early days, it was really forming the connections and the relationships. I feel like I know pretty much everyone on this campus now. And just I really took the time to get to know the people around me, to learn from them, to not collaborate. We actually are advised against collaborations. As a young faculty member, as an assistant professor, we're advised that to get tenured, you have to make your own mark on the world. Right. And so you don't want to be collaborating with, first of all, definitely don't collaborate with senior people. Yeah. And because I had a really famous advisor, and this is true for many of us, right? Yes. Like we have a very famous advisor. You have to really distinguish yourself. You have to really start doing things that are not yeah. going to be like what yeah. your advisor would be doing. Right. But naturally, since you had just graduated, your advisor is still very invested in that project, right? Like, or in that thought, in those th thoughts. So I had to spend a lot of time at Caltech when I first started <clears throat> thinking through where I was going to ta take this field. And um, and when you that say the, the field, what, what, what is the field? What was it called? Nanoplasticity. So I came here that's, as a, that's the name of the game for you at that point, nanoplasticity. Nanoplasticity, yes. Yeah. So it's basically looking at the deformation of nanostructures, nanometals. We call them nanopillars because we made, remember the awesome yes. instrument, the FIB, the yes. Stein beam? So we made them, we made a lot of the nanopillars and a lot of the nano samples using the focus time beam to get them to be nano. And then we studied their deformation. What are their mechanical properties? How do they deform? what are their strengths, what are their um, defects in them, and what is the behavior of these defects, and what kind of data you get. Look, so that was my field. It was yeah. nanomechanics in many ways, nanoplasticity specifically, so what happens after uh, the elastic bonds are broken, basically. And uh, how do different metals, different crystals, different symmetries, different microstructures respond to that kind of a, um, inquisition, I would say. So that was my field, and I had to really have the academic freedom to think it through. Yeah. And I feel like at Caltech, you're given that freedom when yeah. you first come. Now, Caltech back then, uh, this is 15 years ago now, was different. Of course, everyone will tell you that every decade is different. The one big difference between now and then be, being an assistant professor is that we didn't have mentors. 
we didn't have formal mentors and we didn't have informal mentors. And for a person like myself, it made me, for, it made me um, adopt some mentors to be mine on my own. So right? the so system I, that we have now is sort of indicative of what you wanted there to be that you sort of invented yourself. Kind of, we all did. Yeah. All the assistant professors who came at that time. Maybe that's a generational it thing. It was a generational thing because we were expected to just be thrown, in, actually there's a saying that like at MIT, you, they throw you in the water and see if you can swim, right. and then they don't tenure half of you. Right. So, um, right. there. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a humane way. It's not a humane way. They hire a bunch of brilliant people and then they basically throw them to the sharks, you know, and then they're like, okay. Because let's brilliant you. doesn't necessarily translate to a successful leader of a research group. That is a very well put statement. Yeah. Being brilliant doesn't mean that you have the maturity of management right. or leadership or setting up your own lab where instead of doing everything yourself you now delegate these tasks yeah. to others yeah. and you train your postdocs and, and you're you being imaginative and you're solving problems and all, you're all the time all of and the you're above. planning all the time right? right like so basically you would have to be a parent to right. like really figure out how to do all that because you have to recognize that there's so much growing and so much learning to be done and what the way caltech does it is exactly the opposite they will take forever to hire someone I've been on so many searches where we didn't end up hiring anyone or we just scrapped the whole search or something didn't work out and it's just because you really need to fit to be made you the offer. really need to have the, the to be that person so not only do you need to be event to, to have the capability to eventually be the leader of your field that everyone you're going to become household name for some new phenomenon but you have to be a good colleague that we all are going to embrace right and help develop and you have to b just fit in yeah and it's amazing how many people that didn't end up here are now at Stanford at Harvard at, at all kinds of very successful uh, universities doing really great that doesn't in any way it's not in any way a reflection on their research or on the quality of their proposed research it's just it wouldn't be the right fit yeah and so we stand by every single person that we hired with possibly some exceptions, but for the most part. It's a pretty good batting average. It's a pretty good average, yeah, exactly. So they will take forever to hire the right person, but once they do, they really support them to yes. get tenured. So the tenure rate at Caltech is much, much higher than that at MIT, yeah. and anywhere in the Harvard and Yale and Duke and everywhere else, because we really take the time and the effort to hire somebody that we know will succeed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> because of that, I felt supported. I never felt like I needed to be cagey. We don't have too much overlapping discipline. So like I came as a nanomaterials person and I was the only game in town. Like there weren't that many, there weren't any, maybe a couple of people who also were maybe interested in nanomechanics, but not as their main uh, research thrust. Is this because this is sort of a growing field and you're up and coming with it? Or Caltech was just not involved in an area of research that was established. How do you see that distinction when you came? It was both. It was all of the above because there was a person here um, who was doing mechanical properties, but of much, much larger systems, right? right. Like, so just doing, I mean, in every, mechan in every uh, mechanical engineering, but also in every material science department, there must be somebody doing mechanical behavior, right? Like yeah. Somebody has to be studying mechanical properties of materials. So there really wasn't anyone here, certainly not when I came in. Um, there were some people in aero, there were some people in mechanical engineering um, who were doing mechanics but not mechanical behavior of materials. Yeah. And so that intersection was kind of lacking at Caltech. Uh -huh. So they didn't uh -huh. have the right person. To and it. probably that was one of the factors for your hire. Probably, right? And that field was entirely new. And so they yeah. just, it was, you know, I was in grad school. So like that field was just starting to become a field. It wasn't a field at that point. It was just like the, a set of experiments that everybody does. You could be I'm my trying, shadow. <laughs> I am. Like, look at this. I've been trying to stand right here. I'm just going to go. Stuff. I'm just going to go like this. It's well, you can also just do perfect. that. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to worry about where I am. But I'm trying to be polite. Here. Oh, that's, yeah. that's very nice. Um, this idea that, you know, junior faculty should not collaborate, especially with senior faculty, because they need to figure it out on their own. Was this communicated to you? Did you divine the tea leaves? How did you come to recognize the way of, of doing these things? So academia is much bigger than just one university, of right? Course, like, of so course. here at Caltech, I was kind of a singular, we're all kind of singularities here. That's, that's very much a hallmark of Caltech. Everybody here 
represents a particular field, and the fields don't really overlap too much. And because of that, it leads to an atmosphere where you don't compete. Yeah. And so there's no caginess so much. People share equipment, people share ideas. So it gives you that freedom to think about your problems, or yeah. it gives you that freedom without being too stressed out that somebody's going to steal your idea. But of course, the world of academia is much, much bigger, so you, it's a lot of it is hearsay. A lot of it is just talking to, to your mentors, talking to your senior colleagues, talking to people at conferences, talking, you know, just, I had a lot, a lot of senior mentors or just colleagues who would say things and I would really listen to them, right? Like yeah. I really listened to my old advisor quite a lot. Um, I listened to everyone and so the, the consensus yeah. was that if you're an assistant professor, you have to publish some things where you are the last author, right? Like you are the senior author and there better not be another senior author so that by tenure time, people can really value your impact, yeah. right? Because if there are two senior authors, Unless there's, unless it's so clear who did what. Like for example, collaborating with theoreticians is no problem at all, right? Sure. Because it's very clear they did the theory, you did the experiments, so no one's going to question who did what. But if you're collaborating with another senior colleague, either at Caltech or elsewhere, how can they tell what was your contribution right. and who really was the intellectual power? Right. Right. And we have had cases at Caltech where people get didn't get tenured because of that, yeah. because there was a more senior overseer or I guess participants in this and then it, it would it was just a very vulnerable it was just a very easily open place of vulnerability where if yeah. somebody wanted to throw a rock yeah. and say like well what did this person really yeah. accomplish right and unless there's a very clear um, and that's a consideration that's on on capacity for leadership not the science <laughs> probably the science was excellent but if you can't stand on your own two feet that's where the assessment is mm -hmm. so in many ways that's that's fair. In some other ways, it's less fair because it's cultural. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is that if there are certain cultures where you have to be deferential to your senior colleague, whether they're right or wrong. So no. So even if you have all that leadership potential and everything that it takes to make to be a successful person, you're so um, uh, engrossed in your culture, in your own cultural origins, where disagreeing with an older, you know, where it's not so much meritocracy, but it's very much seniority driven. Yeah. You are not allowed to disagree with somebody, right? So if somebody's pushing, if, if a senior person is pushing you into um, an administrative duty, or a senior person is asking you more and more and more to do all these favors or to do all these, all this non-scientific stuff, for example, right, or leadership stuff, you can't say no, and so your science suffers. So that is a huge consideration. So the cultural background and the inability, the so the senior, this is why having mentors can be a double-edged sword. The mentor has to be not self-serving, right? So the mentor has to actually put your career as a priority yeah. and not take advantage of your like exceptional skill of any kind. Now, if you're a really great, if you're really good at organizing something, or if you're really good at running something, or if you don't ever say no to yet another task, it's very easy to put that person in charge of graduate admissions, or in charge of organizing the seminar series for the department, or in charge of some event, where, because you know they'll do a really good job, right? Like, so if you're extra competent at something, of course you're going to get um, all of these tasks being assigned to you. Well, so if I'm you're married to one of those people. Exactly. See, like the super moms and the super capable people, they immediately end up with so many action items because they execute. Yeah. So imagine you're an assistant professor and you're trying, you should be only focused on getting tenured. You should be absolutely working on um, having impact in your field, going to conferences, communicating your science, publishing, 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 all that. But now imagine that there's a more senior person who's telling you like, oh, you know, you did such a great job organizing the seminar, do you mind running the seminar series for our department? Yeah. And then of course you're gonna say, yeah, like you can't say no to a more senior person, right? So you're gonna do that, and that takes a lot of time. Now imagine you also have a child, I mean also your tenure years are your child years, right? Like yeah. that's when you start a family. So then ima in addition to it, you now have a baby and you have to juggle all that. And then they come and they say, you know, um, you were, we're really impressed with how the graduate students are really driven to your lab, you obviously have a lot of, you obviously have rapport with graduate students. Would you mind running our graduate admissions? So before you know it, you're now tasked with these sort of community service responsibilities in addition to being a parent, and somehow you still have to make tenure, right? So you're saying so. one of the values of a mentor is knowing when to say no? Yes, one of the values of a mentor is to say, 
you have to set boundaries and yeah. you have to recognize that when that people that the system is never going to demand less of you because they are empathetic or because like your job and I'm mentoring somebody right now actually right. In, right. in that same way and it's like you not only do you reserve the right to say no to refuse service to anyone but you should really establish a practice of doing so so that you know what your boundaries yeah. are right because so much is demanded from you and the most important thing at, is that at tenure time, the questions are, we're going to ask for letters from the world authorities on these, you know, in this area and in, in general in material science to comment on whether this person is the true leader in the field. You're not going to be able to do that without being that's the expectation. That, that is the that. expectation. Yeah. At all other universities, when you get the MSF Career Award, people say, congratulations, this is so great. At Caltech, if you don't get the NSF Career Award, people ask, like, what's wrong with you? Right. It's the expectation, right? Like, right. you don't celebrate somebody getting something. You're more like, okay, moving on. You know, like, yeah. it, so it's expected. Like, our bar is very high, but we will support you all the way. You know, so, like, we're giving you all the resources yeah. that you need. Now go do all that. So I want to superimpose, before we get to a more in-depth conversation on the mentorship part, for your own experiences, given a very famous uh, uh, advisor. Advisor, yeah. And the fact that this research made a very big splash, right? I'm sort of well positioned to appreciate that lots of eminent scientists who went on to do great things didn't necessarily have a high impact event like you did in your, right? right? You, right. I, to your surprise, right? To my surprise. You're yeah, getting well, invited to me, yeah. abroad. You're on the cover of this. You're yeah. speaking at that, right? It's, yeah. it's not. I would say for sure less than 50% of, of sci uh, faculty had that kind of, and it's probably, I mean, I, I can't speak off the cuff, but You're completely right. it's a unique experience. It is a unique experience. So between the fact that you had this person as your advisor and you had this unique experience of doing really significant research that resonated in the field beyond what a normal dissertation experience would be like, yeah. how did that influence to go back to the question of navigating your way and, and, and figuring out what your research agenda is and figuring out where you needed to be mentored, but also figuring out the question we were talking about before I hit record, when do you drill down and continue with this? And when do you say, this opens up this, this, and this? So how, do you, how did you deal with all of that? Yeah, that's a really good thing to think about. Um, I guess, I'll begin by saying I'm definitely unusual in that sense. I also um, kind of stand out from the crowd because I'm a pianist. So I've been invited a lot to play. Like I would go to a conference and they would ask me, can you also perform? So I guess what happened to me that wasn't very hard uh, for me, which could be harder for others, is to become visible. People became very aware of my name very quickly. So I would go to the conferences and people would be like, oh, that's Julia Greer, right? Like, or, oh, that's the nano pillar lady, right? Like, and I would be playing the piano. So it's unusual to have a scientist play piano, right? So I would if be- I could say also like woman, blonde. Woman, blonde woman in right? science, also unusual, right? Yeah. Like, so there was just a lot of unusual, enough, sufficient yeah. amount of unusualness about me in particular yes. that made being visible not, not a challenge, right. shall we say. Right. So I got invited to places and I would right. go and give talks and I would publish and I would do all that. Now the advice I got was that you have to stay razor sharp with this nanopillar field until you get tenured and yeah. then you can explore. So I finally knew that I was ready to go out for tenure when I wanted to do so many other things. And I very much that was felt your that. Gauge. That was my gate and I didn't even know it. So just like there was so much to do in the nanopillars field still, there were so many ideas that it was pretty easy to pick. So for example, the um, family of metals that we focused on are called FCC, face-centered cubic metals. So the, it's a particular type of chemis, uh, of a symmetry in a crystal. So we face-centered face -centered cubic, so okay. FCC. What is centered about the face? The atoms are in the face centers. So imagine a cube. Okay. So there are atoms at each vertex. Uh -huh. and also in each face center, gotcha. three pairs. Gotcha. So gold and copper and nickel and all those metals that, we're, that are very common um, have that crystal structure. Okay. And so we focused on those and we thought we understood what was going on and kind of figured it out. Nobody had even touched, there's this other cubic family of uh, metals 
that are called BCC, body centered. So now you have all the atoms are in the vertices in one big, and not big, same size, but in the center, not in the face. A clump. No, just an atom. But they're all centered, you said. They're not separated on the face. Okay. Imagine a cube. Right. Right? And you have an atom at each vertex. Right. Right. In a F FCC, you, have, you also have atoms at each face center. Good. In a body centered, you only have it in the middle of the overall cube. Got it. Got yeah. It. So t only two atoms. Right. Versus, uh, versus uh, uh, sorry, the three and what, and what, uh, four, versus four. <laughs> right? So four <laughs> atoms in FCC and two atoms in BCC. Remember I said scientists are people too. You might know more about this than everything, but you still have to count the four. I totally did. Yeah, <laughs> I still have to count because it's three halves. Yes, exactly. Six halves is three and yes. one and one eighth of one. So that's one more. There you go. Four versus two. Um, anyway, so BCC are m metals like molybdenum and tungsten and chrome and all these uh, refractory type metals. Well, the defects in those kinds of metals behave very differently from the defects in the FCC ones. So that was like a hugely unexplored territory when I was doing a postdoc. So my postdoc was all on thin film transistors and organic electronics. And remember I told you I went to a completely different field. So I was doing that, but then I had to maintain some presence. So this is, this was a very important thing. If you're, so I already had my Caltech position waiting for me, but I couldn't be absent from the field for a couple of years, right? Yeah. Like, and so even though I was working on something else, I couldn't afford, I felt like I couldn't afford to be not going to the nano pillar right. symposia and conferences, et cetera, because people would forget about me, right? And so I couldn't start my career. You're being strategic. Strategic, yes. And so I started all that BCC work that no one had even attempted before. While I was doing a postdoc, as sort of like the after hours, I collaborated with a professor at Stanford. Stanford was very close to Park, Palo Alto Research. Everything was in Palo Alto. So it was relatively easy to just go back to campus and to start on that. So I kind of, in parallel, never got out of the nanopillars field, Yes. even though I was doing a postdoc. So by the time I got here, I had it handed to me on a silver platter that we were almost done with that work. So I still made a little bit, not a splash splash, but it was a mini splash, a local splash within that field because we ventured into this other family of crystals. Well, by that time, everybody, especially the Germans, who have like armies of people to do all this stuff, they're like, hey, we can do this. We can use the fib to make a whole bunch. Like, we are not limited to just crystals. Let's do nanocrystal, let's do polycrystal, let's do this, let's do nonmetals, let's do all this. So it just exploded and everybody started doing all this stuff. And that's when I knew that I had to move on, right? Because I can't beat with enough, like as a young assistant professor, you can't compete with an army of 100 Germans, you know, who are all doing like every possible crystal structure. So it was, the game was and still is, is how do you stay, ahead of, like right now, all, everything we do is additive manufacturing, nano-architective materials. I've moved long away from the nanopillars. I still have maybe like a couple of students working on that, but for the most part, we don't work on nanopillars at all. And the same thing is happening. We kind of started this field of nano architective materials and it made a big splash and everybody started following it and now everybody's doing it, right? And so I need to, so we're moving forward. So the game here at Caltech is that you, you can't beat anybody with the numbers. You have to beat them with the idea. You define the field and then the field then gets get rushed into and you move on to the next Once place. it becomes mainstream, it's yes. no longer interesting. Right. So you have to find that, po well, no assistant professor knows this, right? Like the assistant professor comes thinking, yeah. This is it, like yeah. this is my golden ticket, right? And it's only when you realize, oh, this field is actually coming to maturity and yeah. I want to do other things and I want to try other things. And I've always had this idea in the back of my mind, ever since I started doing nanopillars in grad school, what happens if you put them together? What happens if you architect them into, I have some pictures on the wall here. Um, what happens yeah. if you take these nano building blocks and actually build something out of them? Like, the largest dimension within this new material is still going to be just the size of the nanopillar, so it's still nano-sized, but the overall material size could be as big as a brick, or could be like a balloon or something, like something you can touch. So when you zoom in, there's just so much empty space. Empty, empty space, it's like an atom. It's like peeling apart an atom, right? Like there are some electrons, but they're very, sp you know, neutrons and et cetera, but they're very um, widely separated. So that's kind of how the nano architecture materials are, because all the nanoscale building blocks are there, and they comprise this material, but it's 99% it's air. So I've always wanted to explore that, but I <clears throat> was advised against, you know, before tenure, don't try risky ideas because you don't know. So I waited patiently until I got tenure. <laughs> and then I tried, and then I really tried a lot of Did you think from, from graduate school to postdoc to early faculty years, 
was this exclusively basic science? This is curiosity-driven science? Were you thinking at all about applications, startups, companies? Was that in your world at all? Not in the slightest. And is that simply because this is so cutting edge, we can't think about any of that stuff until we figure out what we're actually looking at? It's just a much more mature thing. It's like not for kindergartners. Yeah. You know, it's like when you're in third and fourth grade, you can start thinking about like projects being, having a theme, you know, but when you're in kindergarten, you're learning how to use the scissors. Yeah. So we were just all learning how to use the scissors and like how to make shapes out of the scissors. So questions about how entrepreneurial a place Caltech might be. When you were thinking, again, to go back to the matrix of considerations of M MIT versus Caltech, Caltech's development as a culture of... Fundamental. Fun no, as a, as, a, as, a, as a culture of when you have a great idea, you can think about applications. That was not on your radar at all as a brand new assistant professor. It was, it was a non-issue to you because it wasn't relevant at the time what kind of institution is Caltech based on my applied interests? Because that's getting ahead of the game. You don't have those applied interests yet. You know, honestly, it was the opposite. It was I was excited about it because I didn't have to think about the applications. Uh -huh. It was actually, like, doing fundamental science is really fun. Yeah. And discovering new phenomena is really fun. And, like, that's what I wanted to do. And right. I, that's still what right. I want to do. Right. I, um, I think that that's what attracted me to Caltech because MIT is very entrepreneurial and Stanford is, like, really, really entrepreneurial. Um, but the, but it's not very interesting. Like to me, developing a product is a lot less. In, maybe because I've worked at Intel and I've worked with real product before, that it just. I'm sorry, like that's just not inspiring. But like discovering new things and trying to understand mechanisms and trying to understand how do the atomic like think about how fascinating this is. This is. Atoms are arranged in a particular way. Atoms are doing whatever they're going to do. And we're making connections and inferences about those arrangements, how they influence like some property of a table, for example, right? Or a property of some material. That's fascinating. Or that you can stretch something forever and ever by a thousand percent and something else you can't. Like that all comes from the atomic and molecular nature and the microstructure and how everything behaves emanates from that. So fundamentally, it's really the atomic constructs that govern uh, like our entire world. That's a lot more interesting to me than Oh, can we additively manufacture a scaffold and put something in? Right now, I'm being facetious, of course, and like right now, the applications are meaningful and the applications are interesting, and I would care about whether it eventually becomes a real yeah. product, but it's still not as intellectually interesting. Now, to go back to your innate expectation that Caltech should have a mentor kind of program, which it did not <laughs> by law or even by culture. Or even by culture, right. So did you band together with other assistant faculty members and say, let's do this? Or how did you how did you start to build this? We most certainly nucleated a, a group together. For sure. All the assistant professors were so cohesive. It was like a it was basically like going to school again. Yeah. As first years, but now except now we were the first year professors, right? right. And so we right. definitely all gelled together. We had women like actually we, the women in particular did. We had lunches together, we had women dinner women's dinners together. We really stuck together and it was really awesome. Actually. And this is this is among divisions. This is not just an EAS thing. Absolutely. It was all among divisions. It was women in the EAS as well. Right. So it was just a lot. It was women in EAS lunches for sure. Yeah. With everybody from my class like Azita and Kiara and Beverly like we were all absolutely going to these lunches together as well as across Caltech. Yeah. Absolutely. We would hang out together and then as well as with my with all kinds of colleagues. Um the Caltech culture has been really nice in the sense that we um, have these faculty parties. There's a winter party, there's the welcome new faculty party at which I played. So we had like the introduce all the new faculty and also Julie is going to play, right? Like so I was featured there and then we have the winter faculty party, we have the spring provost reception or something like that and then by the time everybody has kids, everybody goes to the Athenaeum to Alfresco on Fridays yeah. and everybody's kids roll around, you know. Um, so it's a very fit that our professional lives and our personal lives are very much intertwined and integrated together. So everybody knows each other. Everybody who's a parent, anyway. Um, so you mentioned the women of, of, of EAS, the assistant professors that, that you came in with. Yeah, we all have babies at the same time. Too. So, so the lack of a mentor program at Caltech, do you think that's simply a function of this was a guy's guy culture for very long and maybe mentorship for male faculty members 
could be interpreted as a sign of weakness or something I like totally that. I totally think that. You think that there might be an element there? I think so too, yeah. because I've heard another colleague, a male colleague, talk about it after him. He said, like, why? You, we've never needed mentors. Why would these guys need mentors? Like, it was very much like frowned upon almost. Like, yeah. what, it, it was very much the philosophy of like, figuring it out is part of the game. Like, if you don't get the whole professor gig and if you don't figure it out on your own, then maybe this is not the right place for you. Yeah. Yeah. So it was definitely a little bit not not stigma, but there was definitely a little bit of the expectation, like how, like why do you need a mentor? Like you're here, so figure it out. Like that's part of what you're supposed to prove to the world. So the more recent language, of course, is diversity and equity and right. inclusivity. Nobody was talking about these words, or not, not, not at in the way all, that we do no. now. Looking back, if not with those particular words. Do you feel like you were building a more inclusive campus community by thinking about mentorship and not being afraid to ask for help when you needed it? Did you see it in those terms at all? Yeah, I really did. It was really helpful to connect with the friends, with the other women, and hearing them bring up issues, Yeah. right? And talking to the older girlfriends, too. So I, mo I also got adopted by the one by the women faculty who made it possible for us to have such a good life, right? They were fir they were here first, like people like Melanie Hunt and uh, uh, Pamela Bjorkman and Frances Arnold. They were here. They were the first women that were hired at Caltech, and they were the ones who had to go through so much to just <laughs> show them, first of all, that women are capable of being scientists, right? And they paved the way for us. These to are battle-hardened veterans. Oh my God, totally. <laughs> and so we came into a pretty cushy environment where it was like, it's okay to have kids. It's okay to have families. It's okay to yeah. be taking you know time off or whatever. And to the point where they shifted tenure. So there's a tenure culture, and every university now pretty much has it. If you get a year added to a tenure per child that you have during tenure up to two kids, so. Basically, normally you would go up for tenure after your fifth year, then during the sixth year you submit your package, and then sixth year is when they make all these decisions and solicit letters and all that, and then you have the seventh year to leave if you need to. But they would they made it so that if you were to have a child during that time, it would be but you would submit your package by the end of your sixth year. And if you were to have another child, it would be by the end of your seventh year. So they give you an extra year to have a child. But that created that actually kind of backfired a little bit because People who were ready to go at their normal time. So it's a, a little bit like assuming that it's a handicap, that having a child is a handicap on your career, and so like of course you're going to need more time. But some of us were kind of ready to go out for tenure when we did, and so then you and had to. Some of us don't don't intend to have kids. So and some right. of us don't intend to have kids, right. you know. And then like men and women are different, you know. Sure. And then like of course you have to treat everyone the same way. And then the women would say, but that's a much bigger burden on us and all that. So at the end of the day anyone who wanted to go out for tenure or who felt like they were ready to go out for tenure at their normal time had to request to go up early. Yeah. Which is also like, yeah. then the bar gets higher, right? Like, why are you requesting to go early? And it's like, it's not early, it's my normal time. I just was able to do it Yeah. even though I had kids, you know? So yeah. it's, yeah, that was a little bit, so that's where having a mentor would have been great, right? Or like knowing, are you ready to go out for tenure or not? Like, am I doing okay? So we have this thing called the mid, career evaluation where at the end of your third year you are put through a mini tenure so like you s they solicit letters but maybe only three or four and you kind of get evaluated for on how you're doing and it's a reappointment so you your initial appointment is for three years as some professors and then you get this mid-career evaluation or something like that and then then you're given the green light to go forward and to be up for tenure so so it's still a contract it's still a three-year contract and so that you have a chance to go up for tenure. And so at that midpoint evaluation, I actually got some feedback from my division chair, which said something like, keep doing what you're doing, you're doing fine. And then, and then I got something like, you might want to collaborate with some people. Like, hey, I thought and I, I was like, I thought I wasn't supposed to. Exactly, so that feedback is not very helpful. But, so, but this is where having a mentor, yes. like now I would tell. The a mentor could tell you what's what. Yeah, a mentor could tell you, like, th they mean it. No, they don't mean it. Like, what do you mean by this? No, you know, and like, well, they mean you can collaborate with some computational people so that you're not always doing all this without theory, you know, or something like that. Like, yeah. it's, yeah, anyways, there would have been a lot of value in uh, just 
like for example, um, my friend Kiara Dorio, who's a, who's a we started kind of at the same time. I remember we were both in my office and we had just learned that somebody didn't get tenured. So this is very obscure at Caltech. You never know if somebody got tenured because you don't really celebrate. Like yeah. in some departments, it's wonderful. There's this great tradition. You do a celebration, and I had that from my mechanical engineering affiliation. The material science people didn't do anything, nothing, and they didn't really tell anyone. So say you go, say you're an assistant professor. That means that you're not invited to the tenure meetings. If you know that somebody goes up for tenure, you don't know if they got tenured or not. There's no announcement. There's nothing. So. How are you supposed to know if somebody succeeded or not, yeah. right? Like they're gonna be around for a while. You can't just like go up and yeah. ask them. Yeah. And they may not know themselves. And I remember Kiara and I were in this office together and we had just learned that somebody didn't get tenured here. And we were just like shivering because we were like, oh my God, if this person didn't get tenured, like we have no chance, yeah. right? So there was a lot of conversations like that. And having a mentor kind of being there and explaining like look every circumstance is different and I was in that meeting and I understand why this happened and it's not something that it's there's no formula like it doesn't correlate with how many high impact papers you publish it doesn't correlate with how much community service you do you know and things like these that we had to just learn by living yeah it would be great if somebody could have just like stepped in and said you don't need to worry about this you know or there's a reason for that. like everybody's an individual and it's not going to apply to you, you know, or something like that. It would have been great. I remember talking to Harry Atwater and saying I was really uh, very stressed out about tenure. Tenure was like a really th apparently I passed it with a huge margin, but how in the world nobody tells you when en when enough is enough, and that's just part of academia that you don't know when it's enough or if it's enough if it's enough, right? And so I just remember talking to him and saying like I can't process what you're saying right now because I need to get tenured and he said I think that your time would be much better spent if you could focus on what you're going to do after tenure right and I was like I can't think that far right now like I actually can't well, imagine. that was suggested that it was it a was very the job it was like a very much a compliment right yeah. because he was basically saying like you don't need to worry yeah. but I couldn't process that yeah like I c when you are going out that year before tenure is very stressful for everybody because people talk and you would go to a conference and somebody would say, oh, I got a request to write a tenure letter for you. And then you're like, oh my God, like all of a sudden the power dynamic kicks in, right? Because, oh, this person is has, assessing me, has the power. Has the power to influence my future, right? Or I would get people saying like, what, you're not tenured yet? Yeah. That was the worst, right? And I'm like, it's kind of a backhanded compliment because they feel like you should be, but it's like, no, I'm not yet. Should I be? You know, like, right. oh, yeah. So it's a very stressful, very vulnerable year. All right, so last question for today. We're bumping up on 520 already. Okay, that's me. okay. How, when it was time to put your tenure package together, right, just for yourself, if you could shut out what everybody else was saying to you one way or the other, what did you see as your contributions? Going back to that original question about drilling down in this one area of expertise and then also seeing where you could use this as the launch point for what comes next assuming there is a next. What were, how did you put all that together in your own mind when tenure came up? Yeah. Well, I will start actually by saying it felt like I didn't accomplish enough. I think maybe it's like a women, I don't know how many women you interviewed, maybe this is something that resonates with all of us. No matter what I'm about to tell you in a few sentences, it felt like I didn't accomplish enough. Like, there wasn't enough awards, it wasn't enough publications, it wasn't enough talks. So there's the duality there. There's That's the right. There's the internal assessment of right. not doing enough, and then there's the external, are other people thinking? So I wonder if you could deliver And I really want to, that's exactly, I was setting up the stage for that. Because of that, you, everyone who feels like they, feels insecure, right, overcompensate by really shouting themselves out, because that's what I was supposed to do. My tenure package was supposed to be, so impressive and so compelling that they would give me tenure. So it's even more um, of an effort for somebody who feels like they didn't do enough because you have to really exaggerate. You have to compensate for what you think all the shortcomings are. So I had to really portray all my work and all the everything that we've done is something that's really revolutionary or monumental in some way without like being unhumble, right? Like, but, but letting the work speak for itself. And so when I went through that, uh, um, it, it was a, a very interesting experience because it was like, wow, I've actually demonstrated a lot and we really looked at these effects and we, it's a sizable chunk of 
research that we've done that people are citing all the time and people consider to be meaningful and important. So it was it was a reflection. Like it was definitely a, a process where I had to go from feeling like I obviously this is not important and obviously I didn't get enough awards and I should have gotten this one and I guess I got that one, but that's you know not enough and all that stuff. And use that as a springboard to really objectively as much as I could evaluate how much um, how much I have accomplished right and so that was that was a, an interesting like that internal struggle was an interesting experience and when I put it all together I was like wow, I've done a lot and I'm also I'm an extremely energetic person so like I have an unbound you know boundless energy there's always more that you can do almost. there's always more that you can do and so it felt that way to me even though the amount of, like, I've organized symposia, I had uh, organized entire conference, I chaired conferences, right? Like, of course we published a lot. I've given so many seminars. I've given this, like, crazy Midwest mechanics lecture tour. So at the end of the day, I was very, very visible in the community, right? Like, and there was nothing wrong with my package, but it was impossible to see it from that. Was there a place for a mentor relationship to sort of rebalance your own lack of certainty, cer certainty. Oh my God, so much, hugely so. That yeah. would have been the time to have it actually. Yeah. The most vulnerable year. And also because all, we all have to raise money, right? Like we all have to fight for funding. So when you were really well known in the field, um, like I was in the nano pillars, I knew where to go. I knew who the program managers were. I kind of, you know, when um, proposals get reviewed, you generally are asked to review the research as well as the PI. And all the feedback that came back was the PI is very well known in this field, the PI, the PI wrote the seminal paper, the PI has helped establish or establish this field. So there was, I never had to prove Give my, Julia what she wants. Exactly, like it was really not a problem to, to um, be evaluated as an impactful PI. But switching fields, yeah. and that's what many, many people do. Many people that you will interview will tell you that after tenure they went in it they went to biology they yes. went to medical yes. they went to some other you don't have that reputation yet you haven't built it so you have to start you know yeah. young again yeah yeah you have to learn and you have to integrate yourself in the community so I saw all of that nano mechanics research that I was doing as a stepping stone towards moving into these architected materials I really wanted to pursue these ideas I really wanted to put like one Nano pillar wasn't enough anymore. I wanted to have thousands of pillars and to put them together into this like nano Lego constructs and start thinking of them as meta atoms. So when you look at a material and you zoom in, there are all these atoms, right? And they organize in particular domains and grains and things like that. I wanted to now use that, like think fractal, think hierarchical. I wanted to use that as my building block and build an extra level of organization into materials to create fake atoms in some ways, or fake lattices, to see how that would create an entirely new paradigm. It would shift the entire paradigm of how we think about materials. And that's exactly what we showed right after. That's, but that was a huge leap of faith. That was a huge risk. How in the world, how do you even conceive of an idea like that? Right, so it worked out, but <laughs> for us it worked out. But uh, there was just no way to know that, right? And we needed to try, and I needed to inspire my students to try that. And so we didn't. So we made, for about three weeks, we held a, the Guinness World Record on making the world's lightest material until there were some graphene aerogels guys who blew us out of the water. Um, and, but we made materials that were, we made ceramics that were lighter than, that were super light, 99.9% .9 air that recovered, that you couldn't damage, that if you dropped them, nothing would shatter. So they were like nano bricks, but super lightweight, like weight that had the density of water. You know, so it's just like we really proved, we really showed that you can decouple this entire property space and materials and make it be entirely unique materials. All right, last question for today. If you ever thought that, I'll phrase it like this, how much did you weigh the tenure decision as a larger statement of your capacities as a scientist? In other words, there's lots of people, even if it's as a self-protective mechanism, they say, I believe in myself, I believe in my science. If I don't get tenure at Caltech, I know what I'm doing, and I'm gonna take my lab somewhere else. How much did you sort of coat yourself in that, and how much did you really not, and said, going back to that terrible advisor who said, you're not a good scientist, right? How much did you equalize the tenure decision with your quote-unquote 
worth as a scientist, however irrational that might have been. You're really good at this. <laughs> I was just going to bring up both of these. So when I did get tenured, the first thing I did is I called my bo the advisor, Bill Nixon, and I said, I want to shove this piece of paper into, into that advisor's face. I want to yeah, show him, yeah, it's yeah. like, this is the bad scientist that just got tenured at Caltech. And he had the wisest thing to say. He said, don't bother, yeah. because he will figure out a way to make you feel bad. Right. He will figure right. out, he will say, oh, it's amazing to see how low the standards have gotten, yeah. or something like that. He's like, don't engage. he's not worth it. Like, don't engage. That was the first thing. But that was my first thing. It was such a huge self-approval, basically. At that point, I was like, I've proven to the world that I'm the key leader in this field, and I just got tenured. Like, there's not. We become full professors when we are tenured at Caltech. That's very unusual. You came in w after they abolished the associate then. There was no associate anymore. That's right. So I went. we went straight from assistant to full. Everybody does that. And so we didn't even have that associate rank anymore. So basically, there was no more. Right. There were no more hoops for me to jump through. Like, that was it. And I so wanted to shove that, you know, in his face and got the good, wise advice. Um, sorry. The, the first best revenge is living well, you know. Exactly, yes. The first half of your question was also very important, and I forgot what it was. The extent to which you applied a protective psychological oh, code. Yes, yes, yes. And if you didn't get tenure here, yes. you're still a great scientist. I'm still a great scientist, and, go and I'm going to go to Iowa State. So I or, or Stanford. It doesn't have to be Iowa somewhere State. Somewhere else, yes. Exactly. I was so, I was saying these words to everybody. I was like, I know I'm doing my best. I know I'm not cutting any corners. So if my best is not good enough for Caltech, I'm going to go somewhere else. That did not, that wasn't true, and it wasn't in, I didn't believe it at all. Like, I said that to try it out a few times, like, just to my mom, you know, and to everybody, to friends. And then I was like, no, if I don't get tenured at Caltech, I'm going to be done with academia. Like, I won't be able to do that. I, I don't love science so much that I'm going to be able to live with that for the rest of my life mm -hmm. as an academic. So I'm going to go back to Intel, I guess, or somewhere. I, I wasn't going to stay in academia anymore. So I wasn't going to take my lab to Stanford or to Iowa State. Caltech right now. or bust. Caltech or no academia. That's exactly it. Yeah. Either my good, either my best is sufficiently good here, and then I get to stay here, or I'm switching careers and it's no problem. Can always be a piano string. I take it though, in your current role as a mentor, that's probably not the advice. Yeah, definitely not. To give to others. No, because. That's wrong. That's just a really wrong thing. It's just basically a way to wind yourself up into a, like a, this like stress ball, and um, it's not productive and it's not healthy. That's the most important thing. Particularly when Harry Atwater is telling you to think about your post tenure. Well, I didn't <laughs> even process that until much much later. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I think that's what he was telling me. That's exactly right. I think I am actually I'm unsure of what I was. I do. I know two. <laughs> My very, very first tenure case to which I was invited after I got tenured and I was invited was my friend and she didn't get tenured. And then there was another guy who was also my friend, whose wife was my friend, but he didn't get tenured. That was very painful. That was very, very painful for me to, because I couldn't wait. I so wanted to be in that tenure decision room, right? Like, how do they tenure people? What is this like? What is this process like? We all really, really want to be invited, right? And you can only be invited once you get tenured. So I was so excited that I'm going to While go. resisting the pressure to just be super nice and tenure everybody. And tenure everybody, right. And that was very painful because it was my friend, right, and she it was a woman. For, and she had that situation where her more senior mentor didn't protect her. And so a lot of her publications were with that senior mentor. And I was like, I hope you feel really bad about the situation because you should have protected her and yeah. you didn't. And in both actually in both cases, it was a senior mentor who I feel like screwed them. Without, no, unbeknownst. Yeah. Uh, to them, I think they didn't. I think they didn't mean yeah. badly, but they ultimately ended up screwing that person's career. So that was that was hard, and I'm really glad to see they both are very success. They both have very successful careers, and they both are doing really well. But I think that there's something very emotionally scarring about not getting tenured anywhere. And I later learned, much later learned, that in my the two previous people in my position in mechanical behavioral materials didn't get tenured here. So I'm the third one, and I guess I'm the trunk, right? But it was n the pr two people before me to, went to Iowa State, and then another one right after me, right before me, also didn't get tenured. <coughs> so that was, I didn't know that. I didn't know that this position was cur cursed, probably for the better. Um, but there's nothing wrong with not getting tenured and move shifting your career elsewhere. Like, I consider that you just make a different choice. Like, it's a, it's a, it can also be, again, to go back to an earlier point, in many ways it's like a marriage, right? 
Sometimes it's not a good fit. It's not a statement of your capacities That's as a scientist. Exactly. It's funny you should say that because I got divorced right in the year, <laughs> right, right after I got tenured. But yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's either, I wasn't either the tenure. I didn't know that. But it was either the ten, it was either the tenure or the marriage that was going to survive. One or the other. It's so funny. It. But it's exactly it. It's a relationship. It yeah. really is a relationship, and you can choose to have a healthy relationship and work at it, and it takes a lot of perseverance and then it kind of works out, or you give up on the relationship, and then if that happens, then you move on. You just move on to another one, or you recognize, that you're right, like it's not a reflection on you or them, it's a reflection on it not being a good yeah. fit. Some people are not meant to be in academia, like sure. honestly, sure. it's not a good situation, and I tell this to grad students all the time, like grad school is not for everyone, right. and if you're not happy, and if you're not satisfied in a way that you could be in different ways to live, you know, doing a different lifestyle, doing a different career. And doing great science. You only get to live once. Like, it's your life. There's, you're not proving anything to anyone by suffering. You're not making anybody happier or anybody better. It's just you, right? And, like, you're hurting yourself. And God forbid if you have a family or whatever, then, like, they have to reap the benefits of your not being happy. There's no point in doing There's no point in being a martyr. There's no point in suffering. And if the earlier you realize that and set yourself free from all that, boy, it would have been so great to have a, a, a mentor. It just happens to be that I actually love this job and I love working with students and I am so grateful to Caltech for giving me all this. But that's not true for everyone, right? And like having somebody have that healthy perspective and explain that to you and say like, look, yes, you're driving yourself nuts, but it's because you want to, right? right. Like it's because you really care. Right. Because if it's not for that reason, you shouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. On that note, we'll yeah. pick up next time. You weren't just satisfied with one pillar. Now it has to be many pillars. It has to be many pillars. What happens then? 80s v. 1,000 pillars.